Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to The Real McCoy. I'm your host, Mephisto, and always with me, my hetero life mate, all my feelings. Good evening to you, sir. Evening, buddy. What is The Real McCoy? The Real McCoy is your weekly movie podcast where we ask you to go and watch a movie. You watch it, come back to us, and we geek on it and break it down and spin it all around. Today, we are uh, finishing up our Kubrick month with my favorite, my favorite Kubrick film of all time, A Clockwork Orange. And uh, we have guests for uh, with us. First, Shipsidian, how you doing, my man? Howdy. And Gary from Nerdrotic, how you doing, my good sir? I am doing well. Thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So uh, before we kind of start everything, before we do uh, our thing, uh, here we go. Uh, if you want to, guys, if you want to interact with the show, you want to interact with me, on uh, on Twitter at Mephisto or on Instagram at Mephisto79. And of course, you can always email the show at the real McCoy podcast at gmail.com. For our lovely guest, Sheep, uh, introduce, introduce yourself, my man. Hello, my name is Sheep City and I am black. Okay, so <laughs> YouTube, no. if, I happen to, if I happen to say a word that I didn't mean to say, it's fine. Um... I, I am one of the... So you have some sort of a pass. <laughs> Go on. You, we can say that. Yeah, we can say that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so I, um, I I do work for Eric July with the Ripperverse stuff, and I'm also working on my own stuff on the side. Uh, that's pretty much what I'm doing for the most part. Uh, find me on Twitter, and uh, eventually when I get my local set up, you'll find me over there more because Twitter... It's kind of cancerous, but that's that's about it, really. Awesome, Gary. Tell us what you got going go, going on. I know you've it's a lot. Oh, it's a lot. Uh, my name is Gary, and uh, I am. Oh wait, I hit the white people. Hit yes, the white. yes. <laughs> I am white people. Yeah, uh, very white. <laughs> I'm not allowed to do anything or say anything, but that doesn't necessarily stop me all the time. Uh, just uh, watching a lot of movies lately great uh, me too I've watched four movies in the last under 24 hours <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah oh it's a it's, it's a tough gig uh, oh yeah yeah <laughs> i mean I, it's a tough gig for me i'm going on a on a star trek tear lately i've been doing um watch parties basically i just put up a I tell people to watch get get a copy of a movie i just put it on and i just watch it and i've been going through all of them Reappreciating all the good stuff. This week was the voyage home, and it really—it's so fucking good because it literally tied in with episode six of Picard. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's just Picard episode wonderful. six ties into a lot of Trek, including yes. a book that I'm quite fond of called The Return. In a uh, little, little quick little scene. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's been a really fun weekend, to be honest with you. It's been nice to just cover that and also watch Disney burn a little bit. That's been <laughs> that's been fun. fun. That's that's mm -hmm. been yeah. fun for all yeah. of us. Let's just say ding dong, the witch is dead. All right, cool. Like we do every single week before we start everything, before we dive into the movie, we have a little segment called Behind the Screens. Production take two. Behind the screens is where we turn our attention to all my feelings, get the lowdown on everything behind the scenes, the production stuff, everything. Take it away, dude. So it was based on uh, Anthony Burgess's novel of the same name. Uh, he sold the rights for only $500. Oh, At the my. time, do, uh, if, as of inflation, as of, <laughs> of his, as of 2022, it's only $4,500 that he sold it for. <sighs> and At the time, it was actually supposed to be um, a project that Ken Russell the British director was supposed to direct starring the Rolling Stones. Hmm. Whoa. And Mick Jagger was supposed to play Alex. Could you imagine the Rolling Stones as Alex and the Droogies? Damn. Yeah. Who's going to yeah. play Dim, though? I would want to say uh, just a very drugged up Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I want to imagine that, f I think, uh, is it Frankie? Charlie, right? Charlie. Charlie. Yeah. The other, the other guy who becomes a cop. I, I think that would be, yeah, would have been good, yeah. a good piece. Yeah. Right. But the, um, 
the British uh, Board of Film Council actually had such an issue with it, it was never made. So it got just put in limbo for forever. Um, so Terry Southern gave a copy of the novel to Kubrick, and Kubrick didn't read it for years. Kubrick's wife actually read it and recommended that Kubrick read it, and then he immediately picked it up. There, there's a story about this. There, there's literally a story uh, about his wife. She said that she knew that uh, that he likes a, a certain type of book because she would have brought a, a whole bunch of books and she would have like closed the room and she would have heard like thunk on the wall because oh, he yeah, went like, the first couple of pages and then he thunked it off the wall. And then when he uh, come to Clockwork Orange or anything else, he was like, hmm, that's interesting. Read the whole thing and just the and went shiny. after it. Uh, this is actually Kubrick. This is his only script that he actually wrote by himself. The only screenplay. He did not have Ooh. a co-writer at all. It's actually the one that is most true to his version of the novel. Because he actually read the American um, abridged version of it that actually omitted a final segment that had an actual redemptive chapter for Alex. Oh, the one so where you see how, meant- how it really like how it ends very short at the uh-huh. end with with the yeah. just obviously with the two ladies wrestling after yeah. the the minister comes and visit his visits him in the in the hospital. There is an entire extra portion where Isn't he that actually the one where to, he meets uh, Tim, where he finds out Tim is married and that sort of thing. No. Mm-mm. Okay, no. that's a different thing then. That's a different thing. Yeah. Um, Filming actually only took seven months. That's it was short. Kubrick's oh, that's shortest. Pretty, uh, yeah. pretty efficient. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For Kubrick, it's very, For very Kubrick, efficient. that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. So it was filmed in the wide angle lenses using a Canoptic to Gia 9.8 millimeter mm. on 35 millimeter um uh, film, film. So that's why it has that kind of dreamlike perspective where everything just seems kind of off and fuzzy. Yeah. 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 Used a lot of the fisheye, like like we talked about in The Shining, but for different effects. So in yeah. the store, you got that. In the where the sit down in the restaurant, they got, you got that. But yeah. Yep. The fight in the house. Yep. So um, Malcolm McDowell didn't even have to audition. He just picked him up. Yep. <laughs> Kubrick saw his performance in If okay. and immediately gave him the role. Which is great because he showed up on set wearing his cricket uniform. That's where the gang's outfit came from. Oh, nice, cool. But he said, "No, this time wear the jockstrap on the outside." Mm-hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I, from my research, I know that the author kind of liked the look of the of the droogies when they're in that oh, full yeah. costume. Mm-hmm. He really liked it. Yep. Very much so. Um, McDowell actually suffered a myriad of injuries during the, the, the entire shoot. One was he actually had several cracked ribs from the humiliation scene. Mm. Okay. And one of his corneas was so scratched, he went temporarily blind in one eye. <laughs> Damn. That's dedication. And what's odd is there was actually a physician on hand that was administering the saline drops yeah i was oh. gonna ask you how they it's actually him in the seat with the actual wideners and yeah. haven't been to a, a, an eye doctor once or twice in my life i <laughs> i'm in, in the age where you did not get that yeah gary you didn't get that right no Okay. No. <laughs> just a, What's funny is no. just a puff in the eye, right? I got a puff in the eye. eye. Yeah. Well, I guess back in the day, no, they just they just told me to hold it open. Just, yeah. Okay. Just <laughs> follow the instructions. There's no need to force it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I trust you. Yeah. Um, so, th- despite uh, Alex being fanatical about Beethoven, there's more Rossini. Yeah. That's being played throughout the film. Yeah, there's a lot of Rossini, Rossini, a lot in, the, of Rossini. in the transitions and everything. And speaking of that, this is one of the first films to utilize Dolby sound. 
Interesting. Uh, I did the, not know that. Yeah. yeah. On the first pressings oh. of the soundtrack, though, it still utilized the optical sound. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, this is by far Kubrick's most profitable project. More profitable than The Shining? Yeah. $1.3 million budget, $114 million gross. That is that is a billion in today. That, that's, that's a billion dollar movie in today. pretty insane. solid. I yep. like that. <laughs> the first cut of the film was four hours and 23 minutes. Not surprised. That, Not surprised. I want that version. Mm-hmm. I want that version. <laughs> yeah. I, well, the, the sex scene when he picks up the two girls at the record store. Yeah. How it sped up. That originally was 28 minutes long. Okay. I was going to say. With, I'm very good with the editing. Yes. <laughs> Everything that about the score was rad, though. I've got Oh, oh yeah. Oh, that was so oh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. Um, uh, the singing in the rain scene was actually an improvisation. Oh, yeah. Because McDowell, like uh, Kubrick asked McDowell to, to just hum a song and start singing a song. And that was the only song he could think of at the time. <laughs> okay. So they ran with it. This it's did weird. not. It's weird that it, beca- it became such a staple of the movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The yeah. Point of the movie. I wonder what the rights issue was <laughs> back then. They actually had to pay $10,000 to get the okay. rights for it. Yeah. Easy. And uh, oddly enough, Gary. Gene Kelly was so pissed off. Yeah, he would, I bet he he would snub Malcolm McDowell whenever he would see him in social circles. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's a whole generation who knows that song for this movie now. <laughs> yes, and he knew it. Glorious yep. feeling. Yep. Um, all unused footage for the film was actually completely destroyed by Kubrick's assistant. <laughs> For Kubrick said so, or yeah, Kubrick said no. This is this is unused. Destroy it. Okay, mm. cool. Okay, right. So hey. like uh, back no, door. Kubrick. Yeah, <laughs> Kubrick that's confidence. The future. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's confidence. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so the film was actually unavailable for viewing for the for the British public from 1973 until 2000. Really. Yes. Man, those British people are weird sometimes. It's they not really the only are. one that I've heard of that it, that they do that. They done it to um they done it to Caligula, which is odd. There's another Malcolm McDowell movie. Yes. Mm. <laughs> well, given the 28 minute sex scene, it kind of makes sense why he could You mean that it's 28 minute porn scene. Yes. Yeah. Um so yeah. video stores actually at the time would have to put up signs saying, no, we do not have a clockwork orange. Wow. Cause it was in high demand. Cause it was a banned yeah. film. So, um, it was actually one of the first films to utilize, uh, radio mics to avoid audio looping. What do you mean? Okay. So they wouldn't have to use audio looping, so they use radio mics. So they wouldn't they could avoid having to actually loop audio back. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Brain brain fart. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um of many things, the final scene mm. <laughs> took 74 takes. Oh, that's that's short compared to like last week's 147 for Halloran. Yeah, there are well, there are some other ones in there that it's Kubrick being Kubrick. And actually the, mm-hmm. the bodybuilder had a very funny line because he, uh, um, we know how he was picking up Frank and taking him up and down the stairs in the wheelchair. Yeah. He had to do that every single take, take him up and down oh, and up shit. and down. And I think Kubrick did it to fuck with him because the bodybuilder caught him. and was like, well, you're not really known for being one take Kubrick. Are you? Oh no. He antagonized <sighs> Kubrick. Oh. And nope. everybody on set went, oh no, this is gonna be bad. <laughs> Apparently Kubrick laughed it off, thought it was like thought it was funny, but of course. you can see how he got him back. He, <laughs> he learned. I mean he learned that day. Yeah. yeah. After what he did to Shelly Duval. I mean, Shelly Duval came in later, but after what he did to Shelly Duval and yeah, the guy played Halloran, I'm not I'm 
totally not surprised. Looking at Shelly Duvall today, it looks like it had long-lasting effects. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> no drugs terrorized. Holy, holy shit. <laughs> you know, it's... Anything so, yeah, else? Um, everything else is kind of just in the process of discussing the film, so we can move on. All right, cool. So before we dive into everything, we're going to play uh, our game. Uh, it is called Missing Marquee. Doing a little bit of a change up, but this is it. Missing Marquee is where we take 10 posters of movie, have their text written off, we display them, and Gary and Sheep will have to guess which movie this is. Gary, if I have to punch in and make it bigger, just tell me. And uh, here uh, we hey, go. Blind doesn't mean I can't oh, see. No, nope. uh, of course. I did uh, a me. There we go. Uh, Batman and Robin. Robin. Batman, oh, yeah, and Robin. Batman and Robin. Correct. Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, X-Men Dark X -Men, Phoenix. Dark, yeah, Dark Phoenix Dark. is correct. Die, Die Hard, hard 2. Die Hard 2, correct. Uh, Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross. Correct. Mm. Let me punch uh, Jackie Brown. Jackie Brown, correct. Oh, my God. You got me on this one. Cabin in the Woods? Not no, Cabin in the Woods, no. Um, I'll punch in a little bit. Mm. Is this that misery has a yep, you can see the, the title is backwards throughout. <laughs> oh, it's misery. Yeah, I wouldn't have got it. <laughs> I wouldn't have got it. Thanks for zooming in. Now you see me. Now you see me. Correct. Yeah. And last one. Oh, the black hole. The black hole is correct. Oh, I'm not that vain. There we go. Cool. <laughs> I wish this was a team effort. One? That yeah. was a team effort. <laughs> Sorry, I just stepped all over you, Sheep City, and just like a white. Guy. No, it's fine. I'm not more. I'm more of a video game guy than I am movie. So right. you kicked my ass great. on that. Yeah, the, the chat was the chat was all over the the misery one. Uh, usually, yeah. usually when hey, Tom is here, he's in the chat. Usually, when Tom's here, being a guest, he's like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And when oh my feelings is was not here, Tom was like, oh shit, you stomped me. <laughs> it happens. It happens. It happens. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we start this movie with the Malaco Bar. There we go. Pink and punk. Uh, let me do this. There we go. That's much better. All right, cool. Uh, so uh, we get uh, introduced to. Alex. We don't. Uh, we don't get to name him uh, this uh, at this point, but. He kind of explains, oh, we're going to this bar. We're drinking this milk. This milk is not a regular milk. It's a milk plus. Uh, and it gives us courage, which kind of signifies, well, it's, it's fully laced with drugs or whatever. And uh, it's a really nice shot. It's, a, it's really an, an intimidating shot, which actually leads to kind of the violence part you kind of insinuate oh, well this gives us courage to do the ultra violence what's interesting too is uh the dispensers that they had on set they would mm -hmm. have to clean oh yeah completely and refill because the milk would start to curdle under the lights <laughs> okay <Nice>. yeah <laughs> not a lot not a problem I mean, Kubrick has a lot of like sometimes fetish with the with the amount of lights that he does. It happened in two thousand one, where the floor was literally cooking people up, right? And we had the just talked about The Shining, and this one is fully on lit. But most of the movie is not. You get you get very like very specific light sources in this uh, in this one in the first like attack scene. Well, and right. also this is also because of the fact that the budget was constrained because after this is after Bonaparte just was a box office bomb and people bowed out of backing him on this film. Oh, really? That's why the budget was so low. Well, and for Stanley Kubrick, it's very low. And then kind of the the start of the their journey begins, right? Well, I want to real quick. Yeah, you gotta mm -hmm. talk about just the opening credits. 
right? Just how this oh. movie hits you. Like there's big, yeah. there's red. All you see red. is red when this thing opens up. And uh, I'm not going to say this invented it, but this was, this is Kubrick's style. It's very simple, but they are the most stylish credits. They get to the point, the music, it's the, the funeral for, of the Queen Mary. And it's yep. freaking like it's mind blowing. It takes you, you automatically know the tone of this film before you see a frame of the footage from the music and the color red. Uh, that's a, a, just a solid, and that's how beautiful Kubrick was in his uh, simplicity where, with his with his just static shots. Because uh, it's not about static shots; it, it's about uh, the details and the surrealism mm -hmm. he puts in, and you just know you're in for a nightmare ride. On this one and this like it really this this movie spoke to me when i was a kid i got all the wrong messages out of it when i was younger but, um, <laughs> i was like okay ultraviolet all right no but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Dude, just I how everybody that, gets the yeah. wrong message out of fight club when they're younger like yeah Tyler yeah Tyler's best it's like no don't geez. talk about it go punch somebody yeah, yeah. it's not <laughs> me is like when when i hear about people going up to, to fights and everything, they describe it as seeing red in their eyes as, as it shit, shit is literally going down. And it's a, it's a fun, it's not a fun little way, but it's a visual way. And we talked about it all month, uh, how very specific and very visual Kubrick is and is in entire style, whether it's low budget or high budget in like 2001, everything was very particular to the, color of the helmet and the changing of the suit and uh how things look in the shining in terms of lighting and 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 all that all that stuff so in this set piece it literally starts and of course everything you see at the start of the movie like a mirror it mirrors to the end uh right. and then this one it starts with the homeless guy uh the mm -hmm. the, the derelict so the the, the guys who go out and do the fight, they literally pick, they start to pick on the easy, the easy targets in this. One of the weakest members of society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the weakest members of society. And then and it progresses. It's a mirror. It, that's all this thing is. And it doesn't really, <clears throat> we'll get to it, but it doesn't really answer any questions. It just points something out. Points out, yeah. It, yeah. And it's more and also, applicable today than when it came out. Oh, like, most definitely. Absolutely more applicable mm -hmm. today than when it came I, out. I was gonna say, Gary, to your point too. Can you see the almost the Hitchcockian influence that? Oh God, yeah. On this film and, and a lot of Kubrick's projects for their simplicity, especially especially just in the title, title cards and the ending where it's just smash cut. Yep. End. Yeah. Hitchcock, yeah. Uh, Kubrick, and even Gilliam. Gil uh, yeah. aesthetic, yes. Oh like, yes. Everything oh, looks like Gilliam. Dirty lived in not a detail is forgotten down to like right. some piece of trash uh on uh you know everything's framed perfectly uh each frame is a painting uh so yeah they, they, that's why they're the best yep sheep you got some input uh as far as the <clears throat> as far as just like the presentation yeah no it's it's definitely uh reminiscent of a lot of the uh going ons of today um, it, yeah, it's just like you know, it's like I watched it maybe like um, probably about like six, seven years ago for the first time, and mm -hmm. um, and I was just sitting there. I, I watched it on Blu-ray. I'm just watching it the whole time, and it's it's like the opening. The opening was very like it's very not what I've you know grew up with. So you know, it just drops. It just drops. You know, the red screen and music starts playing. And I'm just sitting there. I'm just like, All you're right, focused. I've, yeah, I, I don't know what's going on, and then like this slow zoom out, and the way that it's the way that it like just plays out on the screen, it's just like, all right, I gotta know what happens next. I gotta know what what follows, what's this, that, and the other, and so on and so forth. Next thing you know, by the time the movie's over, you're just like, I should watch that again. I should yeah, watch and, it again. <laughs> and the next, like the next violent scene is literally him hitting you like like a freight train because you literally are are a witness to a grape scene right where it's being disturbed no with intimacy coordinators on the set here <laughs> no yeah. coordinators yeah. whatsoever not in this movie no. so you get you get first of all hit, hitting the the soft target and then we're 
coming close to like adversary, adversarial thing between rival gangs. Like gangs, yeah. Yeah. And um and then it keeps going to after the gang has been destroyed. We're moving on to like this futuristic kind of car. Oh, the Durango ninety five. Oh, I love the, the, the ninety five. Yeah, I love that. That is one of I, I got to get that car, like a car model or something but like that. That scene is so great. With the, yeah, oh, I love it. Background proje projection is yeah, it's so and you can you can tell the is it, like you can tell. Oh, okay, this is like early seventies. I can tell what's going on, but and, and I'm sorry, going, just can, do you. In that shot of the Durango 95 scene with Dim hanging out, if you look yeah. at him, like, the first thing yeah. I thought was, like, Philip Seymour Hoffman wasn't in this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> that actor is very, in, in, in the face, is very, very close. I want to get that shot. You know what? Never mind. Well, but, what, it's, what it's also sets up, right, uh, you, you see them break up the grape. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. a fight. They don't give a crap that they're breaking up a grape. They're, yeah. they're they're yeah. there to do what they actually enjoy more than sex, which is beat the Violent. crap out of each other. Mm -hmm. each other yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But but sex like as soon as the violence ends, now oh, we're yeah. then they go get some. Yeah. We're we'll gonna get some. Exactly. Yeah. The old in out, in, in out. out, in out. Yeah. So they pick uh, and the and the shot is is super specific when you see them driving up the driveway and you see a a, a big sign saying home and it comes up of course like we said it's mirrored at the end where it says home like a beacon right like a beacon calling people to come in <clears throat> although the people inside the house are recluses i would say it should the author is a recluse he is a recluse he is counterculture he is subversive mm -hmm. uh, yes. according to the state yes yeah, and and this is where we encounter basically, I, and to me, after the research, and I kind of knew it, but I didn't know it. It's literally the state is the authoritarian, and the author, and then later on, his crowd, his milieu is literally the academy, the ultra liberal, the far left, as you can say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Hosts or and, reporters. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and both actually are authoritarian because they yep. both want for you to think as they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the, the droogies and Alex uh, kind of saying, Oh, there's an accident, blah, blah, blah. And they walk in the house, pull the guy, pull the woman, you know, have that little uh, singing and singing in the rain singing part. The rain. And to me, uh, there's something I didn't notice before. And I did notice this week and then I went and found out it's actually tied to a sort of theory that there is uh, for this, which I'll, I'll touch upon a bit later. There's a theory because where he sings, he hits, uh, he hits the author once, and then he hits, he kicks him like twice, where it's a little bit awkward, but he kicks him twice, and then mm -hmm. it comes up later again as mirrored, and I'll, I'll talk about it when we get to it. Um, and of course, once they're done back at the Malaco, uh, the Malaco bar for a nightcap and they encounter the media and the actress kind of, uh, canoodling around, uh, thinking high and mighty of themselves, I guess. Did As you notice the only woman they showed respect to was the one dispensing milk? The fake one dispensing yep. milk? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, you're a bit of an apology. Sorry. You know? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. gonna, it's it's gonna when be really Dim is really coming to the, to the dispenser and literally talking to it like, like a, to it like like a real woman. <laughs> yeah, like a real woman. And... And right there, we already have in that scene too. We have the descent that's already inherent in the gang, where the droogs are not exactly happy with the state of affairs. Yes, yes. And uh, Dim standing up to Alex, and then immediately backing down once he's confronted yeah. by Alex. Yeah, Alex. Alex to me is not really an authoritarian, but he's more of a warlord. I would say. I don't know if they call it a, like a 
state authoritarian, more like a like a local boss, local warlord, where like an alpha of the pack. Like a like an yeah, like an alpha, but with real serious consequences. Once Dim kind of says something, he gets hit hard with that cane. Like hard, hard yeah. with the cane. So the cane is there to dispense um authority uh it, and get actually people though, in line. I, believe if, if she had been singing any other aria he wouldn't have gotten hit I don't it's think because it was Beethoven because <clears throat> it was yeah. Beethoven <clears throat> yeah sorry that makes sense uh, I totally agree and uh, I mean yeah he is a warlord but it's a, still a form of authoritarianism like it, mm -hmm. we're showing we're seeing it in all its forms uh, very early it's also foreshadowing something yeah, oh, yeah. like the rest of the story um then uh, we get a little bit of piece of this. Very important. Ludwig van. Takes out a little cassette of Gloopy Gloops or whatever that the name of the band is, kind of a fake band, and putting in Ludwig van, kind of replacing pop, as we say, like pop or or uh, synth with classical, and it's mm -hmm. it's a. It's something that actually comes from Kubrick where he wants to set up a, a dystopian future where it is so like today where the music is very bland. It's very popular, but there's no substance. You don't have to think about it. It's just mm -hmm. there. It's digital, I would say, uh, not analog, but it's not really in terms of... Um, in the movie, you don't actually see it because it's they didn't go. Uh, they don't, again don't didn't have the budget for it. But I didn't I didn't see that they were trying to put it more digital or futuristic. The dystopian future is very bland and terrible. You can see Alex walking back to his house, and it's a it's a sort of like a Soviet block, right? Mm -hmm. Everywhere, it's like a Soviet block of concrete, and the elevator doesn't work, and there's trash everywhere. So there's no there's, really there's a random bra hanging off the staircase. <laughs> um, it's it's, like, it's, it's all, all over the place. And, Broken elevator doors, and he replaces that sort of future with something that reminds him of the the good stuff in the past, kind of like what we do in the show. And um. Right after that, we get we have the very important scene with Mr. Deltoid. Yes, yes. We're kind of you thought ahead. the we're, film we're, was homoerotic. Every single scene, but <laughs> this one is important. We get a little bit of history on a little bit of history on Alex. Mm -hmm. So we know it's he he's been incarcerated at least for a while, and he has a parole officer, and he's a, a pedo. Yep, very much so. Uh, in the way he talks to Alex, in the way he touches, touches Alex. Him. And it seems like Alex is trying to appease him, but he's also a 17-year-old boy. He's still a boy. He just acts, tries to act like a man, mm -hmm. but he's not. He's still a boy. And this gave me really creepy vibes when I saw it for the very first time. I mean, why is he hitting him in the nuts? Same way... Dim got hit in the nuts. Mm -hmm. Very same way. Thoughts? Yeah. Thoughts? Creepy. Good. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feeling the first time I saw it, and uh, yeah, it also you know this is part of the the whole theme of uh, California. You know, the California, but of the state of, of the mm -hmm. of the, you know the state is pure, the state is whole, the state is God, and it's not. Yeah, right. Uh, and, and don't put your blind faith in institutions. Uh, but this is a very dystopian film from a very dystopian era called the 70s. Called yeah. <laughs> brought us some great movies. Uh, but uh, that's just kind of how things, you know, this was at, right after the 60s, the civil rights, uh, assassination of MLK, sa uh, assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, John F. Yeah. Kennedy, like, uh, you know, which followed the 50s, you know. And we had this, we had the greatest generation dealing with their kids and they didn't know what to do. They just didn't know yeah. what to do after all this. Uh, it, it looked like things were, and it was like, it, it, things are bad now, but like things were falling apart back then. Mm -hmm. 
war, peace, time, and chaos. Yeah, and yeah. Vietnam. And, and uh, Vietnam was at the very you know, end where everybody was like, oh, this needs to stop. Nixon, Nixon was in office, and you know how everybody hated Nixon, regardless of what you well, think you of him right the, now. The height of counterculture yeah. beginning, too, in the late 60s. Yeah, that's when uh, a lot of these radical groups that we're still dealing with today uh I can't say started, uh, got a lot more funding, we'll just say, and got yeah, a lot more uh, yeah. a lot more funding from the arts and some very powerful people. They're getting a lot more money and a lot more play. Um, but just to, to give context, as a kid who grew up in the 70s, um, it's pretty bad now in cities. It's not quite as bad as it was then. Like, there was trash everywhere, the cities, all mm -hmm. every, every place looked like Detroit. Like damn near oh, everything. Look at, look at old deal. like uh, stuff yeah. that was filmed in New York City. You see trash yeah. everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. and porn everywhere, like everywhere. And that yeah. that went right through to the early '80s until they started cleaning some of them up. But uh, yeah, it was like uh, there was oil shortages. It was a pretty dark time, but we got yeah. some really good movies. Escapism helped a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Star Wars. Exactly. And you picked the perfect shot. Yes, that's yeah. the shot. That's the shot I, I wanted yeah. because ah. it actually ties into, first of all, 2001 Space 2001, Odyssey. right there. Yeah, right, right there. there. Oh my God. Right Easter there. eggs. There was an yeah. Easter egg in a movie in the early 70s. What? Get yeah, out of here, Marvel. And there's, and there's a few because we talked about it uh, on the other films. Kubrick's obsession with diamonds – it's literally in a place where you didn't even think of. It's in one of the restaurants. And uh, the monolith, which I was looking and looking and looking at it. And at the end, it just appeared. Appears, I, yeah. And I didn't even notice it before. Yeah. Uh, well, my, I we told you there was it. one in there. <laughs> I know, I know. And I was like, I, where is it? Where is it? And I saw it and I was like, oh, there it is. Not only nice. there, there's two of them side by side. But yeah, um, this whole scene where he's courting after these chicks after he literally ditched school, school. and you see uh, the, um, the 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 top ten list again with the with uh, stuff that you wouldn't hear. The music itself is very synthetic as he walks through the uh, the shop. It's very uh, it's sort of reminiscent of classical music, but it's not quite there, right? It's very high pitched and not quite digital but it is digital x s mm. um and he gets yeah, I, th I do woman. believe that he uh it, they utilized an old Roland A54 synthesizer to recreate oh. a lot of the music that makes cool. sense yeah cool um but it is like it's high pitched it's unnerving it's very different from what you get, and then when he gets the two in the house, it's literally William Tell, mm -hmm. the race, right? It's literally the the Lone Ranger. I was like, before, this Lone Ranger. Before, we, um, like uh, we continue on, I I want to say that I'm trying to find that coat that Alex is wearing when he's courting those two women. That is one of the flyest coats I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It it's really almost reminded really Wonka esque, but in a good way. Right. Yeah. It, <laughs> it reminded me because this is the UK, it rem, kind of reminded me of what they were going for with uh, Austin Powers with the ruffle and the like the crush velvet. And it's mm -hmm. like sort of like a relic from the late 60s or mid 60s in the UK specifically. And it doesn't it doesn't really jive with what time this was supposed to be, because it you, you get the Durango ninety five, so I'm guessing they were aiming for late nineties, but there's no real there's no dates in the movie at all, so you don't really know exactly where you are, uh -huh. which is okay. you and are future -ish. will future ish, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm glad that there was no actual set time. Yeah, it actually works in its benefit because you can watch it today and it will fit for today. And you can watch it in, I think I watched it 
<laughs> when I wasn't supposed to, at around the like early 90s, when I was like 13 or 14 years old, it's like, oh shit, there's a lot of tits in this movie. I love this this stuff. <laughs> a lot of bedroom action. A lot of bedroom action. Uh, but then <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman is back again. Yeah. This <laughs> this scene where the droogies kind of like we want a share of the profits because they they had a there's there's a moment where Alex kind of listens to uh, Beethoven and he puts the 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 knight's hall in in the drawer yeah, and he takes out Basil the snake. I was like, ooh, Basil, that's a real UK name. <laughs> yeah, very. That's a prop a proper name, and he has a like a stack full of pounds. Yeah. Like, oh, that's a lot of stuff and, and jewelry. That he's and jewelry, stolen. yeah, and you and from the amount of like watch or like wrist watches you see, it's like these guys have been at it for a while, for a while. So the droogies, all they want is their fair share, right? They're supposed uh, to, like, we did all these break-ins and all this violence with you. We want our fair share. And also, will you please stop hitting dim? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah stop, stop picking on dim. He didn't right. do anything to you, and uh. This I love this shot so much. <laughs> yeah, you, when he sits down on him like that, the sort of you can tell the power dynamic of the group. So you can see uh, uh, Tim. I think it's Tim, right on the on the outskirts of this fight. He's literally does not have a dog in that fight. He's just dragging along after Alex and after the guys, but Dim and. I'm Charlie. I'm terrible with name. Charlie. Charlie. Uh, they're the ones who basically doing this negotiation, and Alex kind of appeases them, just to a point. He's like, "Okay, no problem." And as soon as they step out, it's all in a scene that has been repeated yeah. how many times? Oh, in it's it's now? a it's a a glorious scene, is what that is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's, let me ask you this, uh, feelings, because we, we've we covered uh, Reservoir Dogs together. Um, was, was Quentin trying to figure out the same kind of slow motion walk in Reservoir Dogs, that famous one with this one? Because I thought about it. It's not quite the same because there's no, there's no violence involved, but they're both a sort of like a couple of criminal criminal groups walking away towards the unknown or the next uh, violent episode or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Inspired? That, no, that's actually a great question because uh, it, it did partially, but the other thing that was the inspiration was actually the Warriors. Oh, the Warriors. Mm. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Can you dig it, sucker? Yep. <laughs> Can you take it? <laughs> why did I think it was? Yeah, it's it's Moog. It's not it's not Charlie. I don't know why I had Charlie in my head. It's, it's, oh, Moog. Moog. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm so awful Tim, with names. I'm terrible. I think, with names. I think it was a slang. Pete, yeah, Georgie that's... and Dim. That's yeah, Pete, Georgie and Dim. So Pete is yeah. like the Pete. one that I call. I yeah. call. He's the, he. I forgot. The one. Yeah, like it was a, when he was chewing him out, going, "Come on, tell me." Tell yeah. Me what you got. Oh yeah. In mind. yeah. 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 Uh, but we're going to, after he dispensed some, uh, he dispensed some order and justice, not justice, but not really. They go on and, uh, go into the, uh, another house. Now their, their, uh, their night before has been documented in the media. It was known. So the next victim is not quite willing to let them in. So Alex has to sneak in and, uh, yeah, might have to be a little bit careful with the because the with paintings. The is, is, <laughs> YouTube would probably yeah, not approve of showing the paintings either. Gary, what do you good say? Luck. You've you you have experience with the uh, yeah. Micro- they would, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> they don't care about small peepees, but I think they might care about boobs. So yeah, <laughs> uh, no, no boobs, no boobs. Uh, I was um, I was aiming for the uh, device that Alex is using. Let's say. Oh. Uh, hey, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's you wouldn't have a problem. I'm, I'm def, I'm not sure. 
I was yeah. thinking. I was talking about the paintings in the back. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the paintings definitely. The paintings because in the back. Be, there's a lot <laughs> of never, it's an AI there. reading it. You know. So. Well. You don't want that kind of. Whatever. Thing. It's on. Oh well. We'll, uh, we'll trim it in the in post. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you get oh, to see Georgie boy. You kept on saying, "Why did I think it was Charlie? Georgie boy?" That's Georgie yeah. Boy. Uh, anyway, so Alex comes in with the mask and everything, but he assaults this woman who eventually dies. But he assaults her with a massive cock. He slays Let's her with the beat her on the bush. Yeah. It was there on screen. He beats no her with a, there at all. A, a massive cock where. Yeah, there, there, no, there, there's no second meaning behind that whatsoever. No, no. <laughs> uh, but when he leaves, he sort of gets hit by a massive uh, uh, milk bottle. Oh, well, he gets mm -hmm. double crossed. Yeah, he double double crossed by well, the droogies. So remember, the droogies wanted their fair share. Yeah, the the leader was taking it all. So this is another form of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a political statement. It's another yes. form of authoritarianism. Yes. And he, from, from, from everything that they could have chosen to do, they actually chose to hit him with this stuff that makes you crazy and extra violent, mm -hmm. right? The same drugs that they take, that they've taken for doing this to steal themselves to get to do the dirty deeds that's the one that hits him in the face and uh -huh. you know it kicks him around and of course the cops were already en route oh, no because uh, yeah. the woman inside already called the cops because she was worried she heard yep. about the stuff on the news she didn't want to get hit it sounded like the same mo mm -hmm. so they so uh the cops were already on the way the Droogies didn't know that, technically, but it really doesn't matter. All they wanted was him getting knocked out and getting caught, mm -hmm. regardless. And to me, we got a little intermission. The intermission is the whole interrogation interrogation in the uh, in the um, police station, right? Yeah. The 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 interrogation in, the interrogation is actually the sort of the cutoff point and from there on in it's the other it's the other Half side of the mirror uh, uh, just, just and a quick side note when uh, sure. Mr. Deltoid comes in and speaks to Alex about how he's disappointed in him and how he let him down the spit take mm. they had to do 54 different spit takes oh man <laughs> oh god fuck me hope he and was if you notice, with complaining do you notice at the end, the shot that they used was from behind? It was because it was somebody else spitting on him because the actor who played Mr. Deltoid is like, I have no more saliva. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I ran out on take 33, buddy. Nice. <laughs> oh, my God. Filming. A lot of uh, wet wipes for that one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what coordinator do you need today to make sure that spit thing happens? If you got intimacy coordinator for for sex, what do you get for spitting in your face? Which is so odd too, because later on, the there's a scene where we have. Was <laughs> <laughs> so odd because uh, Malcolm McDowell didn't have a problem being spit on constantly, but he had an issue with licking the bottom of a shoe the, yeah. during the humiliation scene. How he had to lick the bottom. Yeah, uh, the the uh, reprimand's shoe. He demanded that there be a new shoe every single every take. Time. Okay, I believe, but it. it's okay. You get spit in the face. <laughs> I, I, it's a bit off for me. I I wouldn't. I would have a problem doing both, but I'm not an actor or an uh, an adult pretender, whatever you want to call it. But I don't know. Licking the bottom of the shoe where you can actually scrub it in clean with a soap is much cleaner to me than somebody l literally hawk a loogie on your face. No, I mean, but but while he was laying down, that the shot was literally him putting the shoe next to his mouth and licking it. He yeah. would demand they change the shoe. So it was a new shoe every single time, and it was only for that specific shot. So like 30 seconds. So the, the shoe was never walked on, never been worn before, <laughs> every time. So you could use the same shoe, 
Yeah. Like I said, you can literally <laughs> rub it off with some fucking soap. Yeah. Potato, potato, at this, uh, this point. So, like, like I said, we're facing on the, the other side of the, of the mirror for us is Alex becoming sort of a droogie, right? He's in prison. He's been uh, berated every single thing that he does which doesn't fit the exact thing that he's supposed to do in at the start when he goes to the prison. The the prison guard, again, don't know the name and really doesn't care. It's like inspector or whatever. Every time he goes gotcha. out of line, he gets shouted on so hard. Like, That's one of the funniest yes. things. <laughs> Extremely hard. Yes, yes. I, I did find it very funny. That it's guy like, is hilarious. Like, stand over the line. And give it to me from there. And when he throws, there's like he throws, like pick it up. Now put it down. Yeah. Very, very specific, very precise. And trying to trying to keep this guy who was completely way off falling in line. And by the end, where he's completely naked, he is stripped down on everything that he was. And then sent to prison. It's just a number now. Yeah, you know, yeah. He's an. He even number. says it right. Six five five. Six five. It? it is uh, six five two three one. Uh, six five three two one. I believe. What's six, What's five, funny five, too three, is two, one. I think there's two. For five. some odd reason, in the film, they added an additional number. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah, know why. Probably was. Even and it even goes down to the. <laughs> the crack of the ass check, which <laughs> I, I, I don't want to ask Gary. I really don't want to ask, but <laughs> I, I bet. <laughs> they, yeah, that's what I do. They might have not. It's prisoner but, intake. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, that's what they do. That's, that's what they do. Uh, I want to talk it about. much. Yeah, I probably. Um, the thing is this to me. On the outside, uh, Alex was a natural leader. That's why he was the, the guy who was leading the Drugies. He's an alpha. Inside, of course, we don't see the, all the prison interaction, but immediately you see him with that red band. Band, yeah. Which signifies he is somewhat of a leader of sorts, and he's sitting not with all the inmates. He's sitting up there with... The pastor, with the right? With the, with the vicar, I would say. Which tells us he hasn't actually changed that much. He's no, more in no, line. Mean, he's like, he's not looking scared or intimidated by any of this, even when he's getting his butthole uh, uh, searched. It's yeah. a funny scene. Any crabs? Any venereal disease? No, no. This nope. is quick nope. answer. Have you no, sir. No, ever sir. been a homosexual? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> no, sir. And it's funny because Guard Barnes is the one asking that because there is there is more of it that's overly – it's very overt in the novel that he's definitely a gay man. Well, well you can see that in this scene when uh, the two guys are like blowing kisses at Kisses, Alex, yeah. And he's yeah, all, that was guys. Oh yeah. yeah. No my. <laughs> and uh the, the thing is after that that service, um we get to see Alex kind of trying to mend his ways, but to me it was always unbelievable. Like he I don't think he actually wanted to repent, but he did want to go get out of prison. Oh yeah. And he's doing everything that he can to leave prison. Well, then they have the very odd, just random Bible esque battle scenes out of yes. oh yeah nowhere because um, he talks about about oh the good part the, the beginning the of it was really good the they Bible. had good scraps yeah yeah <laughs> the early parts of the Bible where they were out like killing people and then laying with their wives handmaidens he's all I like that part more got a little pre at the end <laughs> yeah and to me and to me it was really funny just because Malcolm did. Caligula a few years later I was like oh shit True. okay I can see you as a Roman but like with this movie and Fight Club you talked about like yeah sometimes like I mean the good parts are like the all the wrong lessons you're supposed to be yeah. listening yeah exactly yeah <laughs> no, it's good 
And then this uh, is what, and what they want. He asked the 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 priest about the Levitico yes. technique. About how he could get out early. He's like, Well, I I don't believe that's right. And yeah, because I do believe that the pri- the priest is actually sees through Alex more than anyone else. Uh, I think the only other one is really Barnes that know that, that he's kind of putting on an act, even though he mm. is behaving, they know it's just an act and he's going to turn back to what he was before. If he were to be released now. Yeah. And I think, um, the vicar actually tells him, uh, to try to discourage him from the method because mm-hmm. he actually sees what the method was all about it was literally thought control, behavior control, and he he kind of comes from it from a from a theological sp- a standpoint where God wants you to have free will, and this method it actually takes away your free will. Free will, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though, again, he says it's experimental and you don't know what what exactly they're going to do with your mind. But all Alex is thinking about is, I'm going to run through this program, sort of like I'm going to do a detox, and then they're going to release me out. So that's my that's my easy way out. Let's just do a, a you know, yeah. sort of a detox where he really doesn't understand what it's all about. <clears throat> and then uh, just real quick, you know that there is that really small scene where they have the the prisoners just walking around in a circle in a circle yes. I'm, I'm trying to get to that scene and how it just seems like it's very out of place like why would you include that scene it's kubrick being kubrick his that favorite painting by vincent van gogh is prisoners exercising after gustave Doré. and this is an exact recreation of it just utilizing their uniforms oh kubrick nice yeah. uh to me and again one of the things i got um, one of the research thing that I did, and I've never noticed it before, is yes, there's a circle, but there's also a, a, a pyramid right above them uh, mm-hmm. right here. Oh, right yeah. there. And I, like I said, didn't notice it before. And one of the things why the pyramid it actually mirrors uh, when they go and attack the guy, the the hobo, and when they're walking. They're at the top of the pyramid, and you see the whole the hallway kind of the light goes to the, the lighting sky, yeah. where it's again nothing like trying to insinuate something in terms of anything extra something, just the composition of the shots where you have sort of these shots where you kind of think about a, a pyramid or a light coming in and dispersing from the top to the bottom. And it happens a few times uh, during the movie, but not something that is significant. Or I didn't find anything that uh, that suggests it's something extra that you you're supposed to think about. It's just a a way of uh, uh, compositing shots within the entire movie. And of course, because Alex is brazen, he actually talks out of place, and he gets immediately shouted out. He's like. What are you talking about, you bastard? Blah 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 blah. You maggot. What are you even talking about? You but the man, that, that was hilarious to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the yell. The, the yell was so immediate it's and so, so off kilter, but it actually catches the minister's eyes and is like, "Oh, I found my fish. My yeah, I found my, my one. guinea pig. Yeah, exactly." <clears throat> And then we uh, go to the, the the governor's office, and it's you can tell that he is reluctant in believing in the minister's proposal on the new reforms. Yes, yes, and I think the the uh, the inspector or the warden, whatever you want to call him, he's also kind of in disbelief, and it's not in this scene where it shows. It actually, when he turns Alex away to Ludovico, where he actually mentions to the the guy who's picking him up. It's like, don't let him out of your sight. He is still a convict, and he might go rogue. And the doctor is like, it's okay. Here, it's fine. We're gonna deal with it. It's Not no this. problem, right? No, but in the scene before, 
Okay, mm. back when they uh, when the minister of the interior is talking, there is some really important lines in there. Mm -hmm. Or the minister, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, but he is the new more uh, liberal government, okay, uh, yeah. that has taken over, and they believe in reform over punishment. Uh, but what he says is, well, these are just common criminals. You know, we mm -hmm. they just essentially we needed to point them in the right direction. We might need them earlier. That's what he's saying because we need. And then uh, uh, I think the warden says, "Well, yeah, you need to give us more money for more prisons." He's all, <laughs> "My dear boy, we're going to need these for the political prisoners." Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Just and before, uh, just before so when just they're standing in the courtyard, and it was like the new boss, same as the old boss. And oh, it's like, oh, but they also call out, you know, recidivism in prison. At the same time that, you yeah. know, like, uh, like they're not wrong. Like you're just teaching these people to be better criminals. And in many cases, in many, many cases that happens. So it's presenting you with questions. It's showing you it's mirroring society without trying to shove an answer down your, your, your throat. You're just like, well, here are some things to ponder. ponder. And I mentioned this when we talked uh, in 2001 about how subversive, Kubrick was because he was very anti-government mm -hmm. and he was inspired by Nietzsche in terms of God is dead uh, and the state is <clears throat> awful. It's literally the state is the most awful thing ever. The, all they want is more power, more and more structure, and they want to oppress you down. He was very anti-government as much as we think about it as I didn't even know he was that I, I thought he was mainly like an anti-war dude. And that's why full metal jacket was there. But when diving into it, full metal jacket was not anti-war. It was anti authoritarianism, anti-government and very much in that sort of direction. Um, yeah, this thing <laughs> you want to, talk about this because this was actually really disturbing to me where Alex is asking legitimate questions mm -hmm. and he is been uh, let's just say softly answered right he's been softly rejected it's all going to be fine we know what we're doing you'll just be fine you'll you'll go through the she kind of explains to him what's going on but she really doesn't yeah she, doesn't understand the gravity of what's about to happen. No idea. Precisely. Yeah. And she's like, Even it's okay. We're going to give you some medication to help you understand wh what's going on and it will make you better. Which to me is like, don't worry. Take this needle and stick some liquid inside of you and it will be just fine. Just fine. <clears throat> uh, COVID uh, isn't a mental illness mm -hmm. right and we're going through we're going to see uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through the like there's both like two sessions of him strapping down to the chair mm -hmm. and first of all he sees a lot of violence and then a lot of sex and it really doesn't phase him that much it, only when they show him some Nazi propaganda and Pairing that yeah, yeah. with Ludwig yeah, van Beethoven, yeah. that's where he's going crazy in the chair. Well, if, if you notice, he actually starts to get sick after the the multiple gang rape that mm -hmm. occurs. Yeah. He said he notices the fact that the the drugs that they gave him are starting to take control because at the end of it, because like and after the fourth or fifth guy giving her the old in and out, I started to feel sick. Sick. Yeah. I, he, he feels it. He knows what's going on, but the the transition between feeling sick and hearing music or doing some stuff doesn't the actually hit him until. Oh well, the, well, the same with the Nazis. The that's why. Well, he has that that outburst too, and it wasn't planned that way. The doctors mm -hmm. even say like, "Oh, oh, happy, yeah, happy coincidence." Different. Yes, yeah. I mean. This yeah, might be something worth keeping in. 
Yeah. And the thing now, that, in a way, if you think about it, because now they can they can test to see if now it's not only just visual just signals that will have well. or emotional signals. Now they can have audio cues. Like, oh, two birds, one stone. Okay. And he literally is strapped in that chair, and he begs them not to not play music. He begs them not turn that specific music. Yep. music. Yeah, turn that not off. Beethoven's ninth. Yeah, I think I I think uh, his his performance like through that whole transition was one of the most like one of the best performances I've ever seen in cinema. How he just starts like the low groan, and then it slowly starts to go into like a screech. And I was just like, that that's how you sell. That's how you sell. I love that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I think Malcolm did a fantastic job with this. Um, I think this is my favorite role with him. I mean, it's a toss-up between that and Star Trek Generations, somewhere in that. No, I'm oh, just joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I mean, it, no, it's either that or Tank Girl. Ah, I, I love Tank too. Girl. Love Tank Girl. <laughs> I haven't seen it. You haven't oh, seen Tank you Girl? Should. Tank you Girl's fun. You should. Ice T is in it. Ice T and Joey Pants. Is Joey Pants is in it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I got news for you. I got Very news for you. Very exactly. good comic. Yeah. Um, isn't the comic way better? A way, 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 like, way, better. way, way better. Way, way, way better. But the movie does okay. The movie tries I to mean, be a silly comic book movie, and it, you know. I mean, that's that's also okay. comparing the the Tank Girl film to the Tank Girl comic is like comparing the Stallone dread. To the comic the, dread. Yeah, like, that's no. very good. <laughs> I was fine with the, and I'm fine with the Stolen like Dread. That. It's not Judge Dread, the comic book, uh, the film yeah. Dread with Carl Urban. That's, mm. Mm. I found a reappreciation for that movie. I, by the way, Feelings, that's a good watched movie. it again recently, like four or five months ago. Remember what I told you about what I hate about that movie? Mm hmm. You can put that away. Now it's gone now. <laughs> out of here. I told you you're going to enjoy it after I, I, anyways. Fucking Carl, man. All right. So uh, I'm not going to go through the entire uh, sort of they you went through the detox. Very then uh, uh, they uh, you have to be displayed for the government to judge. How, look how well we did with this boy. Uh, uh Really, really pompous uh, action by the um, by the minister, and then of course he has these trials. First of all, the sort of the verbal and physical trial, and then of course the sexual trial with the with the woman, where he, after the woman, Alex kind of tells us this is where it kind of hit him on how hard he cannot do what he did before. He is limited. He can't do anything. Not only can he not stand up to this guy because he feels sick, he cannot even think about graping this woman without like vomiting or having this convulsion thing. And the one guy who stands up and talks to the crowd is actually the vicar saying the same exact thing that he said to Alex in private. Whereas, like, aren't you – take a look at this guy. What you did to him, you took away his, his free choice, free will. basically. Yeah. And it, you all, all it did was make it either from a, a violent drone into a passive drone. But he's still a drone. We should have rehabilitated him rather than just doing this thing to him. He is right. nothing. He's a shell of a man. Uh, no, yeah. wait. There. Uh, can't show that. Can't show that. And the return home. What? It's just tits. It's just. It. Yeah. The thing is. <laughs> no, you can't. Try. No, and, you can't. <laughs> okay. Um, the return home. Mm-hmm. Where oh, we yeah. didn't discuss the first kind of. Uh, a yeah, uh, scene correct. where his parents are trying to wake him up, right? When, at the start of the movie and kind of give up on him really easy. His mom gives up on him really easy. His dad is not not involved. Kind of mirroring what Gary said about parents of the of the 50s couldn't handle these kind of kids at back in the day. He comes into the house. He's A, he's being replaced by a random dude. His parents really don't want to have anything to do with him. 
But the thing is this, and this, this is where I go back to the start where I said there's a theory about Alex. The theory about Alex is the Ludovico system didn't actually prevent him from being violent. Why am I saying this? Yeah. Alex, can, uh, Alex can burp on command. It happens throughout the movie. He burps at the start of the movie. He burps when he's being interrogated by the cops. He's being burped when he's being displayed. And he has a burp here. However, after he'd gone through this whole ordeal with the Ludovico system, his dad, like, comes, to get up to greet him, and he, uh, Alex, sort of jokingly tries to punch him, but he didn't have those convulsions. Yeah. Only when he tried to, to hit the tenant. Jack the Lodger, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's where he goes into these convulsions. Well, I think that's because he didn't actually have violent intention. intention he was playing yeah. around with his father. When he had the violent thoughts toward the Lodger, that's when it clicked. Okay. It's I think yeah, I think it's the intent that makes him like, you know, yeah. regurgitate that cuz like, you know, you can play you can pal around all day every day, but when you when you actually think about committing to said act like, oh, I'm going to like, you know, knock this person out is when he goes oh and starts like show the, the weakness of this of this uh 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 rehabilitation. It's not really rehabilitation. You're just like you yes. literally put an inhibitor on something that he still wants to do. Mm -hmm. exactly. I think I think uh, Hora Murata brought up a good point too. Is that would it just because is it just because of a violent sexual interaction, or is it just even consensual sexual consensual. thoughts? Like if he were to have that towards someone, would he still yeah. have that? That's a good question. In in that display in front of the government, he before he grabs the girl's tits and doesn't. He said he wanted to savagely just go get down right there yeah yeah so it wasn't just like oh i want to make sweet love he's like no i want to get like, yeah but the thing is down. this she was she was going into that room presenting herself to be whatever she was you could t maybe say she's a willing partner at that point yeah yes she is an actress that was we know because there's an actor coming in and doing these violent things and hitting alex yes we understand he even bowed to the crowd as well. She's an actress. She's a whatever. But what What if, right? What if he would have gone and done it? Would she be willing or not? We don't know. Probably not. But well, like, no, but it, like said, to that it point, is though, the we intent. Don't, it is the intent. Yeah, but we don't know whether or not, like, to your point, though, Gary, you're right, though. He said he wanted to savagely assault her. Yeah. But is it just because he had that thought or is it now any kind of sexual thought? at all yeah it's a good I, question. I'm, I'm, it I'm sitting there thinking to myself is like you know if even if he did like you know it was supposed to be one of those things where like yeah he's not gonna do it and then he goes for it consensually but then she puts up defenses and then he gets a little violent and then starts regurgitating is what i would think would happen at least and again because it's kubrick and because kubrick's whole mantra or whatever uh when he makes these films is literally he wants you to think he doesn't want you to accept what you see. He just, he gives you a, a, a visual, a story, something, and you, you have to think about what you're being presented with. And of course he wants you to have, uh, he wants people to have different takes on different people. We talked about this when we talked about 2001 with Lofty, he said, yes, this is what, this is what good filmmaking is all about, is challenging the audience, is making something that is maybe a, a little bit unpalatable to the masses, to the, the pop, but it makes people sit around, think, watch again, maybe come back to it a few years later, have a different take, have a different view. All right. Before we do uh, uh, everything else, Gary needs to leave soon, so we'll play our second game of the night. It is Archive. called Screen Fighter. Oh boy. Round one, fight. Screen Fighter for the uninitiated and for Gary is we take two movies, to pit them together and see which one is the best one. If there's no discernible difference between the two, both of them are good, both of them are bad. We fall into our criteria, which is 
a Saturday evening, Friday evening, out with the boys, out with the girls, out with your significant other, two movies in a vacuum. Which one will you pop in? Blam. Oh, Galaxy Quest. Now, Gary, Blam. this is a free for all. Say what you like. Give us no reason. Yeah. Give us all the reasons. Chat participation is most welcome. Just say which one it is. I'm with you, sheep. Galaxy Quest. And I'd see this with uh, anybody. That's a, I'd yeah. watch it anytime. Uh, why? Uh, it's a it's a beautiful love letter to uh, Star Trek, and it's it's also by itself a brilliant film. Yeah, I agree. She says Star. Uh, Star. I was going to say asked, feelings. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, no, I I pick Galaxy Quest over Disturbia as well. Um, <clears throat> it's it's definitely a classic in uh, comparison to Disturbia, and I like Shia LaBeouf, but that movie is relatively boring. All right. Yeah, again, given just the criteria, I would have to go with Galaxy Quest just for Alan Rickman. I mean, <laughs> yeah, Alan Rickman is beautiful. He's fantastic yeah. in that film. Love that guy. It just flat out you has shall be avenged. Disturbia is fine one. <laughs> yep. Moon or Super Size Me. I'm gonna ha- I'm gonna do haven't seen it. Not because I haven't seen it, but it's not really a movie, it's a, it's doc, a documentary. Okay. Mm. All right, cool. Mm. First blood. First blood. Or first moon, blood. first blood, first action. blood, first yeah. blood, first blood. Okay, it's got to be first oh, yeah. blood. I think Moon's a better it's... film overall, but it's not a film I want to sit down and watch multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or Saw. Saw. I'm going to start this time. It's okay. definitely going to be Saw, not because I love horror, because Harry Potter movies I really don't like. However, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone is the closest one to the book. I'm going to give it that. Yep. It's not the best one. Yeah, I'd go with Saw, personally. <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm, I, I love the first Saw movie. It was a new introduction to, like, you know, what would become, like, a, a major staple in horror films. Um, Torture And porn? then it would go on to make a bunch of, like, <laughs> not as good movies. Um, but... It, it, Harry Potter and Sorcerer's Stone is it's it's a that's a movie that's just for like you know in my opinion for like kids for people who still play Pokemon. Sheep, aren't you playing Pokemon? <laughs> yeah, don't you play Pokemon? Isn't that your child? <laughs> no, how many times do I have to promote this like two and a half hour rant on why Pokemon is no longer interesting? Go. <laughs> I go know. to sheep, go to sheep CD and it's in the description it. down below. Watch <laughs> that Pokemon rant. Watch it. It's worth it, dude. It's worth uh, it. Uh, Gary? Gary the franchise. Oh, Harry Potter. Uh I I uh Sorcerer's Stone is the best uh uh Columbus film. I think it's closest yeah. to the books. I prefer uh, the extended version that is out that's even closer to the books. It's still it's still harry potter at its in its kid stage but it definitely this is a, a franchise that grew up with a generation it's that generation star wars and i think it's a very good film and i do not like torture porn not a fan of it at all like i, I, seen, <laughs> I seen saw and i'm like okay yeah that's great right. feelings saw? i'm so gonna have to go with saw you know i'm, I'm a huge horror fan and uh, well i don't like the 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 subgenre of torture porn, I do believe it was at least innovative for its time until, you know, the hostile and everything <clears throat> else started to rip it off. And all right. Should have, should have stopped Whoa. a saw two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Robin hood, the animated version or Jarhead. I see there's Those no first. takers. Well, okay. Well, I, um, Robin hood, the animated movie is the first film I saw in theaters. Mm, the very first interesting. Time in theaters, yeah, because I'm old. Uh, so, uh, I I I liked it then, but I'd watch Jarhead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right, cool, all right, that's okay. That's where I am. I I, I she, Jarhead. Your Jarhead. Jar, I have a military background, so like you know, Jarhead is one of those movies oh. I saw, and I was just like, yeah, no, this shit actually happens. <laughs> all right. Oh man, feelings. I'm going to have to go with Jarhead too, because this is really kind of the the real big start of Jamie Foxx's acting career, because this is right before Ray, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, there was, wait, when did Stealth drop? Was that 2004 or 2006? That was 2004. 
Okay. For. Yeah, because that was yeah, but that wasn't exactly what we call a good movie. <laughs> no, no yeah. it was not. It was not. It was smart house Chat with a plane. Says company. full on Robin Hood, but the panel is uh, is key here. Uh, I'm going to go with Robin Hood. I think from every single Robin Hood film I've seen on screen, which sadly is a lot, this one is the best version of Robin Hood. Oh, better than Errol Flynn's now. No, no. <laughs> I've no. seen the Errol hey. Flynn one. Uh, not not. Little Shop of Horrors. Don't fight me on this one. Yeah, that's oh, uh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah, without Do a not fight me on no this. brainer. I will tell. I tell people. Little all Shop day, of Horrors is one of the only musicals I can actually stand. It's fantastic. Exactly. A Bug's Life is the first movie. It's the first date that I had with Mrs. Meff. Nice. Little Shop of Horrors was the first. Uh, it was almost another Rocky Horror. Oh, like, and I, it, oh, I got my, readings, I people uh, singing along. It just it didn't take like Rocky Horror did. But all right, all and it. this and this will be our last pairing of the night. Wolf of Wall Street or Inglorious Bastards. Inglorious Ooh, Bastards for me. Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, I'm going Inglorious Bastards. Like Wolf of Wall Street was it was it was fun, but it's fun. Inglorious Bastards is just so quotable. That's a great movie. It's badass. Feelings. And it's well, the thing is too, the Wolf of Wall Street is actually based off of an actual person. <laughs> mm-hmm. Where Inglorious Bastards is basically just Quentin Tarantino's own version of history because he has the, the whole red apple cigarette history yep. that goes in there. Yep. Um, I still have to bon go with Inglorious Bastards. I mean, yeah. Bon, Bongiorno. And I, will stand, <laughs> and I will stand on my hill alone and in the dark. I've seen... The first it's couple of times I've seen Inglorious Bastards, I fell asleep twice, twice in the same, uh, twice in the same actual spot, where they're moving on to the transition after, uh, yeah. after the Aldo Reigns kind of talk, the first kind mm-hmm. of uh, b- bloody scene. This is where I fell asleep. I. Love the first scene in this movie with um, oh, what's Christoph his name? Waltz. Christoph Waltz. That scene is hauntingly good. The rest of the movie, not for me. I'm gonna go with Wolf of Wall Street. But okay. there you go. Panel is key, like I said. Plus, always when you get the good pairing, I'm always getting outvoted. But that's fine. That's fine. Gary and I are the same person, except we're not. Yeah, <laughs> true. true. I know the resemblance is uncanny. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, he Gary, looks just like Aragorn. So uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, the new one from the cards. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Ar- yeah, he's Gandalf with glasses. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, <laughs> looking for this guy the whole uh, time. Gary, you 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 need to go. I'm it sorry. Is- I would normally it's stay, uh, but there's a lot of stuff to do. So, oh, there's a lot. Uh, of stuff. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Clock, I, and I got an excuse to watch a Clockwork Orange again for the first time in ten years. And uh, damn, I love it even more. I love yep. it even more, and it's so poignant. So if you haven't seen it, go out and see it. It's on HBO Max, or better yet, get the 4K and uh, yep. watch it. I, get the, I didn't the get the 4K. Here. This just so you know, because we didn't really have a chance to talk about it. This whole show, by the way, guys. Uh, for you guys who are joining us, this whole show is trying to get people to watch these movies. There's so much. And I've taken uh, something that you said a long, long time ago. I don't know if you're using it or not. This is my mantra is the future is the past. Future is the past. In the past, there's so much content. And if you're so disillusioned with what you get of today, don't fail because we can see stuff turning around. But there's so much stuff you can go back to reappreciate, rewatch, or even watch for the very first time. Because sometimes you get to you get to meet people along the way where like, have you seen this movie? No. Well, I have a thing for you. Watch this. Come back to me. We'll talk about it. Gary, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, all the links for everywhere you can find Gary is literally in the description down below. And uh, we'll see you on what FNT? 
Next You'll week, see me on yeah. FNT next week and all over the place over the next week. Lots Real of BBC, Nooner, all that good stuff. John Wick Check 4 reviews out. coming out. Uh, I just saw John Wick 4. Freaking Ooh. loved it. So, it's uh, nice. good. Can't wait it's to talk really about good. it. <laughs> yep. It's good to see Lofty and Tom in the chat and, yep. and Horror Amarata. And uh, what is this? Evil Dead. I saw it. There you go. Yep. And others. They're all here. You. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, it, it was fun. Let's do it again sometime. Okay. Yeah, definitely. All right. Take I care, have guys. Take care. I'll Thank send you, you the list. Please do. Please well, do. I will. Bye See you, man. All right, cool. We will jump into the next because we still have quite a bit of movie to cover. Uh, so uh, we talked about the mirror. Now, after Alex gets kicked out of kicked out of his uh, his house, his home, right? Um, he fa he starts to face stuff from the past, and it starts with the first thing that happened in the movie, where it's the it's the bum, but it's not only just the one bum; it's literally he riles up all the hobos, all the the derelicts of society, the weak parts of society, and he cannot. He's like literally standing there or laying down there being helpless because not only does he wants to retaliate and has these convulsions, these guys keep not necessarily hitting him that hard, but they are ganging up on him yeah. and they're pinning every ailment that they have on him. Not to mention the guy who actually got hit literally got super abused at the start of the movie He's the one with the best grievance of all. But he doesn't, they don't quite get him, right? Right. He's the police, the, 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 the popo show up. But um, it's funny, that scene, I was like re-watching it, um, that scene, it made me, it made me hate the, uh, the derelict a little bit more. It was like, um, because, I mean, I didn't hate him initially. But when he shows up and he's like, you know, asking for change, and Alex is just dazed, looking into the, uh, looking into the, uh, the water, and and then he snaps out of it for a second, just takes the, you know, his change out of his pocket and hands it to the guy. The guy's just like, thank you, and looks up and he's like, you're that asshole, and it's just like, just, just go, just go. He gave you the money, just go. Right, just go. Yeah. <laughs> but yep. then you know, it turns into what happened. It's just like, I mean, just desserts, regardless. I mean, you you, you did a good thing in a way by helping a man who needed help. But at the same time, you did keep him in a bad state kind of thing. So I did, well, he actually made his situation worse, by worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By, by beating on him and not giving him anything, but sort of, you get that sort of revenge, but not quite there. So they are ganging up on him, but not, you don't get the sense that he's in, I didn't get the sense that he's in danger or danger, anything. Right. He's just being accosted yeah. mostly. And when Georgie and Dim show up, the po and now they're the police because mm -hmm. I don't know how many years have gone through. We don't actually know, but generally speaking, they out of school and they're basically serving the same function, but on the other side of that mirror or other side of that coin where these thugs are being co not coerced, but co-opted into the government to be the sort of the corrupt arm of the government, right? The government drogies. Exactly. It, they, uh, they're still drogies, but they're doing it for the man. Uh, the one thing that was interesting, again, didn't catch it at the time. Um, Dim is six six five, and Georgie is six six seven, and when they have uh, and when they have uh, Alex in the middle, yep. it's six six six. Yeah, the nice. the the mark of yep. the beast. Didn't notice it before. Went like I said. Went done some more research. It was very interesting, and yeah, it's very it. very subtle. It's very subtle, and if you don't look. Or if you don't notice, you just look at, I don't know, Dim's face because he has that like weird little Philip Stare. Seymour Hoffman smile. Or even Georgie's smile, you don't actually see here. 
And also, if you notice too, uh, Dim has the air of authority at the beginning, but when he's actually assaulting Alex, he goes back into his giggling fits. Yeah. Yeah. They're going back to the older days. And Dim is being particularly vicious ob- <laughs> for obvious reasons, right? He was the one that was on the butt of the jokes. He was the one at the butt of that cane uh, mm-hmm. numerous times. So he's the one that has the most grievance and he is the, let's say, the crueler of, of them both. Mm-hmm. Uh, and well, and it's Georgie is actually the one trying to pull him off. Say like, enough, enough, enough. Yeah, and yeah. McDowell, McDowell does so good um, in that scene. It's like he, like how how long? I, I didn't actually count how long he was actually held under the water. But well, if you if you notice too, that's that's why it's interesting because if you watch it, you can see from various different cuts how it had actually been multiple cuts spliced together because of the different foliage in the background is slightly different. Mm. Yeah, I was, different try, times I was literally trying to pick up. I literally rewind later. I didn't pick up on the, the changing of the leaves, though. It yeah. seemed like he was there for a solid minute. Like, at least a minute. At least a minute. And I was like, whoa, this is rough. I mean, I was like, yeah. he lick some boots for real he got spat on for real i didn't know it was 40 like 59 takes or whatever but at least once getting spit on that's not a great experience right and well that then he had his rib, he cracked his ribs water? he got his corniest crash <laughs> my Dell went through a lot for this movie that's commitment to the game that's yeah. commitment to the game yeah. That's, that's and, method acting, most definitely. I want to get um, to the specific... What's odd, sh- too, is if you uh, notice no. that whenever Georgie actually hits Alex, there's that odd synth sting. Yes. During that scene. Yes. It, there's, yeah, there, that, that, that obvious, like, not true instrument. So, like, digital, something digital to, to mm-hmm. hit us as the audience to feel that, that blow. And then, of course, like we said, the other side of the mirror, same shot as the Durango uh, 95. We get this with him without a car, beaten, bruised, uh, uh, rain falling down on him, and he's begging for help. And he really doesn't realize where he is until he gets dragged in. And then he says, I kind of realized where I was at that point. Alex being Back the home. narrator for this, was it like the book? Was the book told in a sort of a first person? Kind of, kind of narrative way. It's it kind of like, um, I like to like make it akin more to Fight Club in a lot of ways. Because there are references where uh, the the narrator is actually speaking and also, uh, but that there's also scenes where they're, they're actually just describing a scene, but it's not him describing the scene. It's kind of written in that way. Um, okay. uh, I, I just wanted to know because it it seems like it's more of a um, of a cinematic decision to have Alex kind of under uh, like so you you know what he's feeling, so he's telling you what he's feeling at the moment or his realization or what the because di- he in the prison he kind of tells you the dynamics of what was going on, what he's going through to to get out. Mm-hmm. He's telling you about the the Ludovic system or all that stuff. He tells you that, and then we see him with the interaction. But the thing with this, like I said, you see the the home mirror, and this actually mirrors the same thing because once we see yeah. the home, this is kind of the same shot that we had at the start of the movie, and then it pans out to in the, at the start it was his wife, and his now wife. it's his bodyguard Julie, essentially. Yeah. But what what I find really interesting too is yeah, why Julian. wouldn't he notice Alex from the like he noticed Alex from the paper, right? Yes. It was clear that he was the one that also committed this act against his wife, his former mm-hmm. wife who had passed, and the well, author. But it's not all. It's not revealed until he's actually humming the singing in the rain. 
that yes, Frank because... realizes makes the mental image in his head because he got put away not only for the murder, but also for the other crimes. Because uh, as they mentioned, um, at when uh, his father mentions this, which I want to talk about that, that father scene real quick uh, too. You notice the fact that his father is actually still terrified of Alex. Of him. Yeah. Yes. Because when he's trying to talk about Basil, how Basil had had an accident in the past, he's terrified of him. Um, but he mentions the fact that uh, that the police had come in and confiscated all of Alex's possessions to pay the victims for his crimes, is in plural. So that means that not only for the cat lady who had passed, but also for the woman that he had raped. So yeah. you imagine that Frank would already know that it was Alex who did this. Which is also kind of funny if it's for like, you know, his crimes in general, you'd think that somebody would go, all right, well, let's also go hook up the uh, one derelict that nobody knows about. That's that's a, a nice little attention to detail there is like he's still in that same spot because yeah. that was like a, that was an unheard of crime kind of thing. Well, again, again, like, like the, the silent minority there. Yeah, it's they, like the yeah. like you know the way that society works. It's like, oh well, you have a name, therefore, you know, you'll be mentioned. Whereas this person who has nothing, they, oh they well. Mm -hmm. I, I want to give props to Evil Dead in the chat. Julian, Julian is David Probst. Probst. Yep. I yep. didn't, I didn't notice it. It's Darth Vader, literal Darth Vader, and I didn't know that. Hmm. I genuinely did not know that. That's you see, I'm so bad with names. I don't didn't even look at the cast list. The only significant guy I know is Malcolm McDowell. Malcolm, yeah, because I didn't care the name of the guy who played Dim. I didn't care about the guy who played Georgie or the other guy. I don't even know the name of the actor who played the the author. By the way, the name of the author is Alexander, which is you know kind of weird when you think about it. But again. Mm -hmm. In the attack, the guys were masked. Yeah. Well, that's why mm -hmm. he, he didn't know he didn't know who attacked him. The fact that they talked about Alex being reformed from an act that was done, they didn't mention the author. They just said he's a violent criminal. Right? Well, but uh but moving on from that point too, what's actually really interesting too is like how immediately Frank is actually able to, to clearly identify that Alex is the one who got reformed, right? Mm -hmm. But, oh, now, oh, the police had beaten you after they had done this stuff to you and turned you basically into just a neutered version of yourself. I can utilize you to further my goals to bring down yes. this version of the government. So it's yes. just, again, we're, we're essentially, no one actually really cares about Alex, at all. They're all just trying no. to use them to further their own goals. Well, I was going to save to this when I talked about, uh, I told you there's a theory that says Alex is merely pretending even through the Lud Ludovic system. Remember I mentioned the fact that he hits the author twice. He, twice? Yeah. he, he kicks him twice. Taps he taps on the, taps the, on the bathroom twice. twice. As soon as he gets to that, not only that specific note, but also in that specific uh, line of where he sings at the start. Uh, and yeah. again, mirror, again, we talked, it's always mirroring, mirroring that one half of the again. movie. And again, like I said, it's a theory. We're meant to think, we're meant to mm -hmm. come up with some new ways. I thought this one from everything that I've went through, that's why I didn't put too many notes it's the only note i have is is alex pretending or not um i'm on the fence there there are stuff that convinced me yes he, he could be pretending this whole time i'm just looking for the benefit where's the benefit of pretending pretending and there is a <clears throat> benefit to pretending especially out on how the movie ends uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm on yeah. the fence. I'm on the fence. There's no benefit of pretending if there's no gain. Because if he's still the same Alex at, from the start of the movie till the end with no ch no real change, just pretending to, to people, where's the benefit? Right. What, he's out of prison? 
that's why they needed that final chapter that was cut from the abridged See? version that Kubrick didn't read. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If there's no if there's no benefit, then why would you pretend just to be out of jail, but you weren't in jail in the first place? Right. There. That's that there that's where I got stuck. And then it opens up a whole bunch of more theories for people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's why I didn't I didn't follow it through. Uh anyway. So we got Alexander, the author, calling his mates, and then that's, that that's Frank. creepy ass yes, Frank. D- uh, dinner or lunch, where you can tell, you can tell <laughs> Alex knew Alex knew he was being drugged. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, don't you want some of this? Like, no, 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 no. You go ahead. You drink this, and he's being he's. Being coy, first of all, he didn't want to drink it at all. And yeah. when he's got stuck in the corner, he's like, okay, let's do this full on gulp. And right. the author is like, here, have some more. You must have enjoyed that gulp. And he puts more in. It's like, more wine. More wine. <laughs> more wine. <laughs> and sort of like his, his tone of voice is sort of screeching and it kind of, Felt like somebody's like pulling on some, you know, nails on a, on a yeah, chalkboard, chalkboard kind of a voice. Yeah. And it worked. It, you really dislike him at that point. And it, oh, that was really, supposed to be the whole thing. It was supposed to be unnerving. And that's why it took so many takes for them to get that shot. I think oh, that's really? why that was uh, like, you know, when when um when he hears singing in the rain again, uh, Alex is singing it. That's like all it was like when all those memories just flooded back. He went right back to that moment where he saw what happened with his wife, and it's just like you know, it, uh, all that all that uh, rage is just sitting right there on the front of his tongue again. Funny that you mentioned yeah, tongue. It's literally it's like he's <laughs> literally vomiting as right, like convulsing and vomiting while he's re reimagining that moment of his yeah. life and how well, his wife kind of. He, she didn't die immediately. She literally withered yeah. away, right. which is could be far, far worse. Well, and far, it's, far what's worse. so odd, too, is how he had that response to the song. It's exactly the punishment that he delivers to Alex. Mm-hmm. After he tells the, the woman writing the report on him about how now he can no longer appreciate Beethoven because of the Ludovico treatment. And so... You, we see Alex kind of trapped in that room. I, I don't have it now because I've got something else queued up. Um, tr- Alex in the room, shouting, screaming, can't get out. His head is pounding because, A, the music is loud, but it's not the loudness of the music. It's the stuff that it, cause, that it causes in his brain. And mm-hmm. the shot of the author... Oh, man. It yeah. starts... It starts with a smile, like he's enjoying this, but it turns into anger and frustration Mm -hmm. literally 10 seconds after. I I did the jump. It literally is 10 seconds, and you can see his face change, and Mm -hmm. it's so creepy at this point. But we promised Monolith. Now and there it is. Okay, cool. Yep. This I like and it. this. Literally stuff that, yeah. that comes up in Kubrick a lot of times is that black monolith from 2001 and the diamond shapes that was in the Stargate transition in 2001. So the, the big shapes that you've seen uh, while in transition where you're like, ooh, these are like weird this is there. This is very, very Kubrick. I want to say I that can... that no, go ahead, that, go ahead. I was about to say, uh, much like the rest of the zooms, uh, zoom outs in this movie. Um, I I am a fan of the just like the positioning of everybody in that in that uh scene. How you have like you know the um how how you have the like the uh, the leader of the pack like there in the middle, just like relishing everything that happens. You have this um right hand. And then you have like you know the next the uh, the other two that show up later the reporter and the other guy with him and he's just rolling the um 
the uh, the billiard the balls, balls across the table. There we go. They're all red. Like that's that's I, I that just the uh, the imagery, I guess you can say. Like yep. this this right here, just like this is like one of my favorite scenes. Like he's like uh, Alex is just being tortured. And um, he's screaming. You can hear him. And it starts to fade out slowly as the music gets louder. I love yep. it. Yep. I love it. Every moment of this was just great. The Like Gary kind of said at the beginning, and we said at the beginning, uh, the, use, the use of the color red is very, very important in, in the vis- just the visualization. Like I said, the armband that Alex used to kind of differentiate himself from the others is literally the the red armband here we've got he's playing with the red balls the red at the start (laughs) it's all connected to the same thing and if you uh notice or didn't notice alex had two cufflinks on his white suit Mm -hmm. it was two eyeballs eyeballs with eyeballs with red like sort of like blood dripping from them but not really uh so th- that use is very, very specific because the other droogies, when they had a little bit of coloring, was either orange or yellow and bluish for yeah, Georgie and for Dim. Yeah. And they had the little sides and sometimes they had the, 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 the thing. However, yeah. Dim, the only thing that you could say, well, Dim did have some red is at the very, very beginning, he had an um, enhancement of red lipstick. It's not very pronounced, it's just to accentuate the whole, like you said, sheep. When he, they do that zoom, you can see dim from all the way back mm-hmm. because he had that red lips, and you can see who Alex is because he had the um, the eyelashes, the fake yeah. eyelashes. Yeah. And of course, um, I want to get to that. Yes, there it is. So there, there comes a point where it was too unbearable for Alex to give it to, you know, to bear and sorry, English. And he jumps off, like I said, from the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. There's another little pyramid there, although it is skewed, right? He jumps off the top of that pyramid all the way down, all the way down. Okay. Right there too. You know how it does that change from Alex going down to where it goes to first person perspective of him, him yeah, going down. Yeah, and the down. camera yeah. uh, like swings around. Yeah, how that was done is they actually uh, used a Newman Sinclair clockwork camera that was inside of a box, so it was protected, and they literally just pushed it off. Oh hmm. wow. That's impressive for it to stay like you know facing downward like that. Then yeah, and it was like. Uh, Kubrick was so good well, they had weighted the corners of, of the one side where the lens was. So it would actually mm. stay. So it oh, that's flip nice. Over, so it would just go right down. Um, the stuff that the, you can do with practical effects, effects is amazing. Yeah. And Kubrick was so impressed because the first one that they used only took six takes for it to break. <laughs> and they nice. push it up three stories. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then of course, uh, he gets visitors first, his parents come in and they're Mm -hmm. really shocked and they tell him about how the evil political, uh, you know, author got arrested with his mates. And it kind of harkens to the fact that the minister said, well, this, these prisons are for political, you know, opponents Yes. And Alex seems a bit, you know, angry. He really doesn't want to talk to his parents at all. Well, you know what he says to his father, right? I don't remember. What makes you think you're welcome here? Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. He's really, really angry uh, because they didn't protect him. They didn't, yeah. I don't know, teach him to be better. They basically left him alone to his own devices even when he was living in that house. And of course he had the interaction with the, um, the nurse. And then he has the interaction with the minister. And I thought this was so government. It's unreal. 
We were, oh, the the vicious people of the, the, the Ludovic uh, Institute. And he literally puts the blame on everything Everybody that, but he caused, that he caused, right? And of course, the almighty media, like the opportunity to get some mm -hmm. shots with the exactly. poor derelict, you know, victim. Like he becomes, and it's so strange. He is the cause of all these real victims. And yet he becomes the victim himself of the government's own device. And such a, such a, I don't know, it's, subversive way of talking about your own government, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It's, it's kind I mean, of, it, it's kind it, of funny. From the like, Kubrick st standpoint. Right. Um, well, I was it, about to say, um, it's, it's, it's kind of funny how like, you know, you look at it, like, um, you just like zoom way out and you just go, well, what all kind of happened here? It's like a bunch of punk kids got in trouble. One of them got caught. The other ones, you don't know how, but they ended up becoming, you know, an arm of the state. And then they convinced this last one. It just took a little more convincing with this one because this one's a little more, uh, uh, I guess you could say uh, virile and um, uh, not virile, but volatile. Excuse me. Um, yeah. He's a little more volatile. And, um, you know, it, it just took a little more coaxing with this one. The other ones were easy because they're they're not like they're not the thinkers. They're not allowed to be the thinkers. So they just get dragged right in. This one we have to do the actual like, you know, convincing on because it's because he's for lack of a better word, alpha, but you could have said uh, natural leader. Like I said at the natural beginning, leader, yeah. he is a natural leader. He was a natural leader inside the the prison as well. And it's hard to put down natural leaders because they tend to just manifest themselves anywhere they go. With the droogies, the sheep, the crowd, the whatever. Not me. They, Yeah, not you. The people who just blindly follow the trend i was we say they will be malleable to either do harm or do harm but in the name of the state so see, it doesn't really matter on which side of the law they are they're just following orders the only exception is basically uh pete not tim pete where like i said the continuation of pete's story is literal uh, he got up, he got out of school, got disassociated from the, the violence and becomes an, uh, a model, not a model citizen, but a model citizen. So wife, kids, job, right. a normal individual that normal just, person, yeah. just does whatever we do in life. So he's the one that, job, he's the one that just went through the face. Exactly. He, and he was the one who was the most passive. Well, in, in so many ways, too, can can you not just think that that, given the fact that how, with the dichotomy that was inherent in Alex's gang, how if like they were so easy to co-opt into following the status quo or becoming part of the machine. Yeah. But yeah. what they had to do, the steps that they had to take in order to subvert Alex's behavior, in order to model him to work for them, essentially. Yep. Um, and... And I but, like the fact that we kind of finish up with this. Like I said, it's right before the cameras walked in. Sort of the imagery is the state feeding the the citizen. Feeding him the lies. Yes. Feeding yeah. him the lies, feeding him food, making sure he's well taken care of because you have to stand in front of the media and pose, not really tell the truth, just pose in the name of whoever's in charge. Yes. Again, um, they don't actually say uh, political sides. They don't say right this or left this, but everything is sort of implied. That, well, I think, it's um, yeah. I, yeah, I think um, Kubrick said in one of the interviews that he thought about the more right-leaning government in power and the ac academia or the author is the, the left, the radical liberal left. But it, you can exchange any political views in terms of radical one side and authoritarian on the other side, other but side. it literally is the same thing, just the other side of the coin.
two arms of the different of the same beast. Yeah. Kind of thing. Um, I did want to make a, a point too. Did you notice how throughout the that last scene, how he's being fed, Malcolm McDowell's demeanor starts changing and he starts mm-hmm. popping up in his mouth. And yeah. Chewing really loudly. Mm-hmm. Like a child. It was done on purpose. It was done <laughs> specifically on purpose because Malcolm McDowell knew that Kubrick was getting bored. The last scene took 74 takes. Yeah, it's God Kubrick for you. Damn. And it only took seven months to film. Yeah. yeah so, so Malcolm McDowell was also getting, he was kind of getting bored. Everyone was getting bored. So he just started making like just popping up in his mouth and being as comical as possible as he could in the confines of the character. Nice. Yeah. But it works well as the government feeds, feeding a child yeah. Yeah. as a, ch- as a parent to a child. Mm-hmm. And they want to feed the parent to a child because that's where the child is depending on the parent. Sort of like what we see today. Yes. You just feed them alive in digestible bites. Yes. However, this whole time, this whole time, what Alex, what we see in Alex's mind is literally two bare naked ladies fighting each other because that's everything on his mind. Well, because what you can think of then is actually where it's really a, really apparent when he's actually having that conversation with the psychiatrist, how he his thoughts become more vulgar and violent, where mm-hmm. essentially attempting to kill himself broke him out of it. Yep. Yep. And I, of course, I can't see, I can't show that last bit, but it ends as it began uh, Just red. with red. Big Red. Big, big red. And that, my friends. The only thing that was missing from a Hitchcock ending was actually just had it listed as the end, then a film by. Yes. <laughs> yes. Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. But. <sighs> All right. Let's do, uh, let's do a wrap up. Sheep, any final thoughts about the movie as a whole? The Like sort of the visual journey that we've seen. Um, well, I, this, it's one of the things, it definitely, with the Clockwork Orange especially, um, points out why film discussion is necessary, because, like, you can watch a movie by yourself, and, like, in a vacuum and, and enjoy it, but it's not until you take other people's perspectives in that you go, okay, well, I didn't notice this, okay, well, that does make sense, okay, that is a good theory, and, like, you know, it has you, it has you thinking more about, like, you know, why this is so good, why it's entertaining, how it grabbed you and like you know how it could also apply to something that you might have missed and you know it for in that moment it attracted you but you don't know why and someone explains it and you're just like that might be it and that just like further cements these movies as great which is like one of the things i love about like you know classic movies stuff where you use practical effects and they use like you know thought uh, thought provoking shots and different kinds of like you know um symbolisms and whatnot to to tell the story without having to necessarily like just handhold the uh, the watchers and whatnot that's 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 what makes this movie along with like you know the shining like some of my um well two of my favorite uh kubrick movies out of all of them cool feelings uh, i don't I, th- well this is not my favorite kubrick film it is my second favorite but they're, oh, right um, they're neck and neck because obviously well th- huge stephen king fans so yeah um, no. <laughs> I, I didn't expect any, I didn't expect anything else because yeah, I've I've I'm, actually went went back and rewatched uh, uh, last week's podcast and y- we can tell. Yeah, well, what I th- what I think is really important about this film is that it is it Stanley Kubrick's work is again like Hitchcock, like um, Gilliam, like Tarantino, uh, like Scorsese. It stands the test of time. Um, even, even, even films like Goodfellas, while it is an inherently a mobster film, it is still, uh, a great, just a story about morality and how someone can get lost even in their own sense of morality in the confines of greed. Um, but right. with, with this, like, um, how we discussed how it's now even more apropos than today, than I think it was even at the time of its release, um, given the the disconnect between when Anthony Burgess wrote the novel and when Kubrick actually released the film. 
I think it was, was it 71 or 72 in this? 71, yeah. 71, 71, okay. I think it was more apropos in the, in the 60s when Burgess wrote the original novel than it was in the 70s, but it was still apt then. But now it's, it's even, again, apropos now. You can still put it and apply it to what's going on today in the themes yeah. and the medium. And um, Sheep, I think you, you brought up a really fantastic point about uh, just discussing films. And that's why, Meph, you always mention the fact that we want, it, we want, to, enter, we want it to bring these older films or maybe films that you haven't never thought of watching before. Like, um, I, know, I know some of the films that I showed you in January, Meph, you weren't exactly bit that big of a fan of, but hey, there were still films that you hadn't seen before. It, but it's the, good to talk whole, about them. Yes, the whole, the whole point is... Again, even listening, even when we cover original Lethal Weapon, there's stuff in there beyond the action, beyond the uh, the the surface level that you can talk about. We talked about this when when uh, when Culture was here uh, on that Lethal Weapon uh, um, uh, podcast. Even though he was here for a very short time, there was sort of. Yes, dealing with depression, dealing with the job, dealing with race relations because this is L.A., uh, white and black cop. It's not just a buddy cop movie. It's a it's a, a Donner version of a time, a, a place, and a, a, a feeling. Uh, it, it is what it is. And it's, again, not only these movies, just more artsy movies like you see with Kubrick, but also with the mundane, you can tell a story. Like First Blood, we mentioned this before when it came up, First Blood is not an action movie. Mm-hmm. It, it is a, a statement on PTSD. It's a literal statement on PTSD and what happens if you push a, a, a combat vet to the absolute limits when he comes home with PTSD and nobody treats it whatsoever. Whew. All right, Kubrick, my favorite film, uh, Clockwork Orange, for the very longest time. I didn't know what Clockwork Orange means. It actually yep. means the facade of an orange, which is a, an organic, viable, lively thing, but inside it is like clockwork. It's mechanical. It's, it's industrial. It's robotic, not the facade of something lively. And, and that's the dichotomy between the two. Is it, is Alex the clockwork orange? And I think, yes, on the outside, he looks like an alive person, but inside, because of what he's going through, he becomes the mechanical orange, not the actual orange. That's, that's my take of it. Um, well, it's, it's actually a British term as well. It is a British term. Yeah. I didn't know. Cause again, it's, this is why I love doing this. It's going deeper into the weeds with, with these type of films uh, where you see the hidden meaning. You, you think about the hidden meaning and you actually grow and get a, a different perspective of, of it. For, to me, like I said, a whole new perspective again, which is good because I like the movie on the face, you know, on the surface level. Right. All right. Cool. That actually brings us to the end, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sheep, please tell us again, before we leave, where can people find you here? Oh, wait, here, here, right there. Right there. Um, <laughs> that's, that's me on, on YouTube, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, locals. And I even know, linked your yeah. rumble and your odyssey as well, just to be safe, just to have all the, all the, uh, all the alt tech or hopefully tech platforms tech, tech, yeah. exist you uh uh except for painting and doing some community work for eric are you looking towards i don't know gaming stuff or anything else uh surprisingly not really i mean i've been playing a lot of like you know cl- uh, like older games like i've been diving back into dragon's dogma dragon quest builders and great uh, game god very Eater. underrated <laughs> Uh yeah, well you talking about Dragon's Dogma? Dogma, yeah. Or, <laughs> oh yeah, no, yeah, it's, it's my favorite game of all time. Um, but yeah, no, I've just been playing a lot of like you know older games than the newer ones. The newer ones, I mean, I'm kind of looking forward to Tears of the Kingdom, um, the sequel to Breath of the Wild. But 
it's not something I'm just like, oh, I'm I'm like I'm hyped and ready for it. It's like, yeah, when it drops, I'll I'll try it out, see how it goes, kind of thing. That's that's me for the most part, because most of my focus is going into like my work and trying to get this uh this comic book off the ground, uh, well this manga specifically off the ground. Working on this tabletop game, I'm de- I've been developing for like a little over a decade now. Um, that's that's pretty much been my uh my focus and trying to maintain a relationship with the squid we're doing great there's, there's no worry <laughs> but um as a man it's my job to say stupid stuff so <laughs> you know I'm, I'm usually in the mental and of dog course, and of course you're a member of the crew that is the, the midweek mid-week hump hump yep so check, every wednesday out. evening uh, uh, and of course, you can 11, catch me there, dropping in on the you know the after show on Rumble. Eleven I love doing starts, it. Uh, it. Right, it, cool. It starts, uh, sorry, I was about to uh, go, just go plug ahead. the time. Go um, yep. It starts every Wednesday at nine PM Mountain Time, eleven Eastern. And that's 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 what I was going to say. And cool. Mephisto shows up for the after party. It's great. I, I show up for the after party when I can. When I can. All right, cool. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, next week we are starting a whole new month and we're going to cover Star Wars. Yep. Original, 1977. Yeah, as a surprise. Didn't expect <laughs> it. It is what it is. So show up next week. Star Wars, 1977. Not a new hope, not a fucking whatever. Star Wars, 1977. Uh, and we'll see you uh, next week. Oh, you know what? No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Burp, burp. If you want to interact with me, you want to interact with the show, at Mephisto on Twitter, at Mephisto79 on Instagram, and email the show at the room of podcast at gmail.com. If you've reached this far, like this video, share it around, and if we entertained you enough, be subscriber because this is ain't going anywhere because this is fun to do. Mm-hmm. See ya. Peace. You're still here? It's over.